Amen, amen. Well, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. That's where we are tonight, and we will be picking it up in verse 47. So just to give you a little bit of a running start here, since we haven't met since Friday, we are the night before Jesus's crucifixion. So we've had the Last Supper together with the disciples and Jesus, and then off to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is just in agony praying to God that if there's any way that God could possibly do this some other way that he would let that cup pass from him. And yet he says, not my will, but your will be done. The disciples fall asleep, not once, not twice, but three times no. they fall asleep. Although I read somebody today that I had never thought about this because I was like, how could you possibly go to sleep at this point? And the person said they had done a Passover Seder one night for, uh, you know, Passover. And they said, you know, there's there's cups of wine and there's like all this food. Oh. <laughs> and they said it was over and then there was a service. And she said, I sat down in the service and I was like <laughs> nodding off. And oh, she said, all I could hear in my mind was, can't you stay awake for one hour? So she goes, I think it was the wine, the good food. They were just already tired. And it all kind of came crashing down. That's on an them. interesting point I hadn't thought about. I had thought that's why I thought I would share it with you yeah. because I was like, oh, I've been so judgmental all these years, but I can totally see that happening. So, anyhow, we are now at a little more solemn of a atmosphere here. We are now at verse forty-seven, and we are about to watch Judas just flat out betray his rabbi, the one who chose him, the one who he's been with for three years. This is unfathomable, but he's about to do it. So, Noel, why don't you go ahead and pick up in verse 47. Just yeah. go as far as you think you want to. Yeah. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Oh, it's so sad. Yeah. All right. So... We kind of mentioned this before, but we'll just kind of mention it again, that in those days, after a rabbi and student had been together for a while, a disciple of his, it was very common practice, especially in that type of a relationship for the student to approach his rabbi with a very honorable greeting, which was just a kiss on the cheek. It's what they did, and they still do in some parts of the world. Uh, sometimes they'll do the double cheek kiss, and, and there are some it's people here cute. in our country that do it too. I always think it's yes. really cute and really sweet when that happens. But this is particular to Judas and Jesus, and it was a sign of respect and a sign of honor. So how does that make you all feel just thinking back on that and kind of picturing the scene in your mind that here comes Judas and he walks up to Jesus and he puts his hands on his arms and out of respect and honor plants just a soft kiss on Jesus's cheek. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, Deb Kirby says, does the three times mean anything in relation to G raising Jesus from the dead in three days? You mean the disciples falling asleep three times? Yeah. I don't really think so. There's no indication that that's some sort of prophetic thing. Also, Jesus was like, oh, <laughs> stop <laughs> falling asleep. Yeah. yeah. So, but that's a great question, Deb. Thank you so much for asking You're that. You're going to see the number three happen a lot and it's always good to ask if that's always good yeah sometimes it means something, something greater sometimes so not so much lauren says it just makes it even yeah. worse. and i think that's jesus response here when he says judas are you betraying the son of man with a kiss yeah so he says why would you be kiss him if he's about to betray him i think that's what jesus exactly. is asking seriously this is how you decided to do it judas you want to approach me with respect and honor and so hand me over to the men who are going to kill me? Really? And it's just, I mean, it's this really fascinating duplicity of the character of Judas. It's, it's horrifying. It couldn't really. be much worse. I mean, if yeah. you've ever been betrayed by somebody, probably, probably it was mostly done behind your back. Like, not to your face. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you try to picture that and how it just, man, alive. Yeah. And Jesus knows exactly what's happening. And I wonder if that sort of stunned Judas. Hard to know. I mean, he should have been stunned a whole bunch of times this night. And, he and yet he also should have known, I'm dealing with 
this really, I mean, he doesn't seem to believe he's God, but yeah. goodness, what is he? <laughs> yeah. Well, unbeknownst to Judas, apparently, he is actually fulfilling more prophecy. And Noel's going to type these references in if you want to look them up later. Psalm 41, 9 and Psalm 55, 12 to 14 actually describes this very thing. And it, sure enough, prophecy always comes true because God knows for sure what is coming in the future because he knows everything. He knows the future. Well, it's the last question that Jesus will ever ask Judas. In fact, it's the last thing he will ever say to Judas. That's it. It's over. And the arrest actually happens. So I think at this point, what we wanted to do, and some of you saw my little question earlier that I turned off the comments for, because <laughs> we wanted to make you kind of wrestle with it on your own. If if you have already done a Bible study with me or Noelle, you may be like, oh, I know the answer to this one. I've talked about this before. If you can possibly hold back from Just giving us <laughs> your the the exact answer um, to let other people kind of chime in, and then we'll let it's you chime in It's helpful to actually walk through the logical process if you've never done that before. Yeah. And so we would encourage those of you who have already done that with us maybe to just yeah. hold back a touch. So, so we're just going to kind of step back for just a second from the text, and we're going to ask the question, if Satan knew that Jesus' death on the cross would be the death knell for him, like this is it, and he did know that this was coming, by the way, because yeah. Genesis 3.15 talks about it and you can look that up as well so he knows if he knows what is he doing yeah. <laughs> he doesn't want to be defeated so i want to hear from you what, what is satan doing on earth we know he possessed judas right mm -hmm. and judas acting very much in the uh <laughs> acting as satan i guess his proxy betrays jesus what is the strategy here what is satan's strategy. Deb says can't wait for this. <laughs> and by the way, if you're not familiar with the story, because we kind of stopped in the middle of yeah. it, Jesus is arrested. He is tried. He is crucified. I mean, the whole thing, like everything that Satan is trying to put the brakes on, goes ahead and happens. And perfectly according and fulfilling every single prophecy. Yep. So we just put in two prophecies that were fulfilled by Judas kissing Jesus on the cheek. Judas, who's filled with Satan directly fulfills prophecy so that's fascinating what is going on here what is the it's radio silent out there <laughs> what is the Everyone's strategy like, i'm not i'm not weighing in on this is this something you've ever thought of before because yeah. i have to tell you that for a long long time like when i was growing up i used to kind of think in my mind like why did he do that yeah roberta says he's fulfilling prophecy lauren says was satan maybe hoping that jesus somehow wouldn't rise again oh i think that's a great point lauren maybe maybe uh, like noelle like, and i were saying earlier we're like how much into the mind of satan do you really want to get <laughs> like, i know <laughs> not, not too far but yeah carolyn says could it be that satan didn't know that jesus would be resurrected mm -hmm. i think that's a very good question okay. susie fighting to the very end thinking he could somehow have victory Great that's point. Good point. Mary just says, tell us. <laughs> Detail. Detail. <laughs> Louis says, God is in control always. God is omniscient. Yeah. Yes. That's a that's... big word that means he knows everything. Yep. God always knows everything. Yeah. Satan, on the other hand, does not know everything. Praise right? God. He is not. He's very smart. He's very crafty. And he's read, I mean, he knows what's in this book, right? So he has a lot of information going into this mm. that's influencing his decisions. Susie says, did Satan actually think he was greater than Jesus? We know he wanted to be, for sure. Yeah. Lauren says, mm. I don't think he really had a choice since it was God's plan. Hmm. And Emily, oh, <laughs> I, have I, to, I have to, I have to read it. it went I by love too it, fast. I love it. Emily says, Satan did know he was part of the plan. Ultimate burn. Ultimate yep. burn. Roberta said, this is a tough question I have thought about. Mm. And Bob says, the phrase sealed with a kiss Ooh. comes to mind. Kind of puts a bad so, spin on that, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So we're gonna walk you through, and this yeah. is this is one of my favorite things to do because the thing we're going to demonstrate is the power, the omniscience, the plan of God, and how even when everybody has free will and is actively working against that, God's plan still prospers. It's really, really incredible. Right back to His sovereignty. That's a word we've been yeah. talking about a lot, and it's it, you can't read the Bible without crossing that 
subject a lot yeah. because he is he's so sovereign and I was actually talking to my husband about this tonight we were eating dinner and he said what are you teaching on tonight so I was talking about it I got done and both of us just kind of had this collective like oh thank goodness praise God with everything going on in the world that you can just sit back and go I don't understand it it looks like evil is running rampant but praise God he is in control yeah. <laughs> nothing has escaped him so I think you're going to feel the same way tonight that's my hope so let's just back up for a second First of all, I want to make sure that you understand that Satan has actively been attempting to keep Jesus from going to the cross for a long time. He does not want him to go to the cross. He wants him dead, but not on yeah. the cross. So back in Psalm 3420, and again, you can look these up later, it talks about how the Messiah, when he's crucified, not a bone will be broken. It's a messianic psalm. Not a bone broken. So yep. That has to come true. Zechariah 12.10 talks of him as being pierced and mourned for. Psalm 22. You have to take some time and read Psalm 22. It Okay, again, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years prior yeah. to the entire thing. Prior to the development of the whole thing of crucifixion describes crucifixion scientifically to a T. Yeah. This is unreal. It, that In Satan's mind, that cannot come true. And then Jesus himself in John 12 to 32 said he would be lifted up. Okay, so lifted up death was always death on a cross. And those verses are coming. Noel is um, commenting them right as we speak, so you don't have to worry. She's going to be like typing them in tonight. I've got a whole computer for this. <laughs> Something else that I want you to know. Way back, if you were with us, in Luke chapter 4, so this was a couple months ago Yep. Um, for us, years ago for Jesus, but a couple months ago for us, verses 1 through 13, Jesus is tempted. Do you remember this? He's tempted on the mountain. And we said at the time that Satan tempts him in three ways. One is to doubt God's love and care for him. He's mm -hmm. not going to feed you. You're hungry. Turn those stones into bread. God doesn't care about you. The second one is really interesting, though. He says, all the kingdoms of the world are yours if you just worship me. And, and that just means you don't, Jesus, need to suffer and die to get the kingdom. Get the kingdom now. Don't suffer. Don't be crucified. Don't go to the cross. Yours is the kingdom. All the kingdoms of the world. And they can all be yours right this minute. Does that sound like Satan not wanting him to go to the mm -hmm. cross? And then it was throw yourself off the temple because the angels will catch you, obviously. In other words, let's see if we can kill you this way. Because you being thrown off the temple is not being lifted up now, is it? And you'll break every bone in your body yeah. at the same time. So we see in the temptation right there, Satan is going... And, and by the way, I could back up even further, but I just don't want to take like four years to do this. Then Matthew 16, 23, Jesus is talking about his suffering and death. And Peter, his right-hand man, Peter, says to him, Oh, Lord, may it never be. And Jesus says to him, Get behind me, Satan. I think that's Talk a really, that. it's, it's a really interesting statement because Peter's intentions certainly are... Not, They're noble. Yeah, he, he doesn't want to see his rabbi suffer. I mean, I think we can all understand that. And yet what's really, really interesting here is that Satan, once again, is using people and things to try to avert Jesus from the cross. And so Peter's saying, Lord, may this never be. May you never suffer in this way. Mm -hmm. Isn't it so interesting that Satan, in so trying to lead Jesus towards comfort, towards a lack of suffering, towards peace, Kingdom. And happiness, yeah, kingdom. Have your kingdom. Trying now. to walk him down that path, but Satan doing that. So one of Satan's tools wow. is to walk you down a path of complacency and comfort. And ease. It's so easy. And not going through the proper channels mm -hmm. to get the things that you may want to have. Yeah. To circumvent. Isn't that so interesting? I mean, I think we normally think of Satan, you know, trying to lead into destruction and, you know, chaos and awfulness. Mm -hmm. And here we see him going, no, no, don't suffer. You don't want to suffer. You don't want to go through this. No, have it easy. You could just have the kingdom now. Everybody will like you. Yeah, it'll be so, you can have such a great time. He's crafty. He's and a liar. And that's still the voice of Satan. That's right. Keep that in mind. That's right. <laughs> well, 
So I wanted to give you that little bit of background so that you're not going, well, maybe he didn't, I mean, maybe he wasn't trying to keep him from the cross. He yeah. absolutely was trying yeah. to keep him from the cross. Now, also, he has been and continues to be through the story and even now, continually, actively, always evil because yes. that's, that's all he can be. You understand Satan, like, like you might be thinking, well, why did, if he thought it was going this way, why didn't he just walk away? Well, a couple of reasons, but one of them is he is pure evil. He's always evil. He cannot do anything good. He can't. It's not his nature. He is the opposite of God. God who cannot sin. Well, Satan is the antithesis. He cannot be righteous. He cannot do anything ever good. He is pure, unadulterated evil all the time to the max. So yeah. as he is working in this situation, he has to, by his nature, do the absolute worst things he can possibly come up with. And secondly, he has, you might say, he should just walk away. You're making it worse. And we'll see over and over how he makes it worse for himself. You go, just walk away. Well, here's the thing. Satan knows if he walks away and doesn't interfere, God's plan is happening 100%. If he doesn't interfere, it's happening. And so his thought process is, well, I can't make it any worse by interfering. I at least then have a fighting chance that something's going to go down here, right? So that's sort of the thought process here. And I think it's also interesting that Satan continuously tries to kill Jesus. And this is interesting because Judy just made a point. Yes, please read she that. said, does Satan believe that if Jesus just dies but doesn't rise from the grave, then he, Satan, will reign. I think absolutely yes. And the way that he can be certain that Jesus will not rise from the dead is to kill him in a way that completely contradicts all prophecy. So we see numerous times where he tries to get Jesus stoned. And stoning was an awful practice. The Jews did it primarily. I mean, there weren't a lot of other cultures that did that at this time. And what they would do is first take the person up to a very, very high place and push him over a cliff and hope the fall kills them because they break their neck. It's horrible. And then if they don't, then they roll these big boulders over and push them off to crush them. Okay, this, if, if Jesus died that way, he doesn't fulfill the prophecy, right? He's not lifted up in death. All of his bones are broken. I mean, that's how you die if you're stoned. And certainly the timing's not correct. Yeah, And so exactly. Satan's like, excellent option, stoning. The Jews stone people. Let's go. I'm going to keep moving towards that. So keep your eyes open as we go through this text here in a few minutes for opportunities that Satan is trying to push the Jews. Do it yourself. Don't wait for the Romans to kill. You, they didn't have the ability to do it. Rome had said no capital they punishment yeah, they for you. They were legally allowed to do it. We'll take care of that. But we know in the New Testament book of Acts that they lose it at one point and they go ahead and they stone Stephen. They're just so mad they can't wait. Yeah. So we know that they're... There is that possibility that they, they could do that. They could do something like that. And Satan is push, push, push. Come on, you guys do it. You guys do it. And we'll see more of that in a minute. Yeah. But here's the first thing that happens even prior to that. And that is, remember that Rome, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Rome likes peace. They do not like uprisings. No insurrection. No, 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 no. In fact, we just said um, a couple of Bible studies ago that Pilate, and Herod, maybe I didn't say this. I don't you did. Remember. Okay. Pilate and Herod were both in Jerusalem at this time for Passover because they wanted to make sure with the influx of people from all over the place, up to maybe 2 million from the normal 600,000-ish population in Jerusalem, we don't want any problems. And we don't want any would-be messiahs coming and yeah. stirring things up. So they had their Roman rulers. They had sent lots of troops, Roman troops, that were trained fighters in just to make sure people Nothing could see them. Happens, yep. There's going to be peace. So we're going to see here right now as we read about um, Jesus's arrest after Judas's betrayal, how Satan is going to push like crazy to, come on, come on, Rome. You, you don't have to have a trial if you have an insurrection. They yep. can take you out on the spot. And it's not a crucifixion either. They would no. take their spears and their swords and they would start hacking away. They would not only have to just take out Jesus for Satan to be thrilled with this, but 
the whole 12, or at that point, 11 apostles that are left that Jesus has spent three years training to go out and share the gospel with the entire world if they can take them all out. I mean, I can just see Satan just salivating at this moment. He's going, here we go, here we go. And I'm going to, he says to himself, I'm going to use Peter. I'm going to use Peter to make this happen. Yeah. He's a sitting down. Remember, Jesus has just said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Well, here we go. Get ready yeah. to be sifted. So let's remember, when he was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. Can you talk to us? It, the The book of Luke doesn't do an amazing job of talking about what this crowd was. Right, it, it's more succinct. Yeah. So this is the shortest gospel account, by the way. So we're going to be referencing a lot of the other gospels to kind you. of give a bit of a more holistic view yes. of what was happening. If here. we say stuff that you're not reading, it's in one of the other gospels. Promise. But go ahead and look it up. Um, so I believe it's in the book of John that we're told that they had a Roman cohort along and a cohort had about 600 trained soldiers. It's they, big. That's really Think big. about how many people that is. Oh my goodness. All of them armed, armed, all of them trained to fight, obviously. Then we're also told that the temple guard also accompanied them. That would have been up to 200 or so. So around 800 people now. Now we are up to about 800. And then the whole Sanhedrin is there, so another 70. And then their servants, which we know were along as well. So, so 900 something. We're thinking about a thousand people. Can you here they come. picture? He's up here. A thousand people come up, Judas leading. You're like, oh no. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> yikes. Yeah, that's a little bit scary. That has to be. So. They come up, and in verse 49, it says, When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Because you can imagine, I mean, you've got a Roman cohort coming. You're like, do we need to, you just talked about swords a few minutes ago. Should we, like, have that going on? One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Again, Luke is succinct. <laughs> yes, and he is. maybe protecting his sources a little bit. <laughs> well, he's very thematic. So in John 18:10, we're given a little bit more information about this ear slicing ceremony. Oof. Yes. And we're told that it was not surprisingly, Peter, of course. Who's the most zealous? Who's like, I will never betray you <laughs> or deny you. Guys. Yeah, um, at this point. Remember, Peter has been told by Jesus. Jesus prophesied, hey, before the rooster crows next morning, you will deny me, not once, not twice, but three whole times. And Peter was like, no, I won't. I will go to prison. I would die for you. I would never betray my rabbi like that. I would never deny you. So he's got a little something to prove right now. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that this is kind of in the back of his mind. And he's thinking, I'll show Jesus. I'll show him I'm not going to deny him. I'll take yeah. out my sword. And I will quack that guy's ear off. Now, what we're also not told, but what happens is that Jesus speaks to the crowd and the words coming out of his mouth knock them flat. Like, like he, on their backs. They he physically fall over. flattens a thousand-ish people by the words, I am. Because they ask him, are you Jesus? He says, I am. Bam! Down they go. John 18 is the parallel account where he talks about this, mm -hmm. where Jesus speaks and the whole crowd like levels out. And so that emboldens Peter, who's like, oh, okay, I see where this is going, ho oh, whack. Yeah. And is like, this is going to be a good time. Now, what should have happened, and if it hadn't been for Jesus and the sovereignty of God would have happened, is that those thousand people would have stood up and slaughtered Jesus yeah. and his 11. <laughs> you sort of think, no mean, match. Yeah, this is sort of the first aggressive act. This is all they need in order to yep. just go in and go at yep. them. Peter just sliced a guy's ear off, that's enough, we can take them. And how much Satan wanted them to. Again, in Satan's strategy, he wants Jesus dead, he wants all the disciples dead, he just needs to make sure it's not done on a cross. And so he is going to do everything. He's manipulating Peter, going, hey, you're not, not going to deny this guy like and look how good this is going you just flattened everybody how about you show him you show him how dedicated you are you you tell him and peter's like yeah i i wouldn't do that you know what we're gonna get this thing started and he whacks a guy's ear off and jesus goes no more of this and scolds him put the guy's ear back on real quick yeah 
So you can sort of imagine as everybody's still kind of like stumbling up from they just got knocked on their backs, all of a sudden Jesus is like healing this guy's ear where there was blood before, there's no blood, and they're like, they had to have just been what just happened? completely taken aback. Yeah. And you made a really good point. We were talking about it regarding how the Romans viewed deities. Yeah, yeah. So we've got 600 Romans here at a minimum, right? And they're a pagan culture and they're a pagan society. They worship many, many gods and they're very aware of like supernatural things and mystic things. And so, first of all, they get knocked on their backs, freaked out. Second of all, they see a guy put another guy's ear back on his head. They're like, they don't have a lot of context as to what's going on. They haven't been in the region. They're been not thrown Jews. off their game. This is never They don't happened. know what they to don't do. They don't have any training for like, what do you do if a guy speaks and you fall down, all of you, and then yeah. he heals a guy's ear that's been on the ground? Yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> It's a disturbing moment for them. And so I think whereas in a normal situation, the minute somebody pulls a sword, they're at them and they're going to take it down. They're going to shut it down because, I mean, the Roman army was truly one of the greatest armies of all time. They were so highly trained. They're not letting anything get through. So the minute Peter pulls his sword, they should have been on him, you know, just massacre. I mean, that's what the Romans did, yeah. right? They were quick and they were efficient. But because they're so disoriented, they're so freaked out, they're like, who is this guy? We were told we just had a little uprising. This is not good. This is weird. Not comfortable. They're really cautious and they don't move forward like they normally would. Right. And again, I think that's the sovereignty of God. 100%. That, you know, what Satan intended for them to massacre them at that moment, God goes, I'm going to disorient. I'm going to confuse I'm going to show them supernatural things that freak them out. Yes. Deb um, Pinkerton. She had... says Peter Pry was looking to chop the guy's head off. Did he just miss and get an ear? Yeah. Maybe. We don't know. It, yeah, that's we a really that. different. That's a really different motion, though, from chopping a guy's head off to chopping a guy's ear off. Right. Unless he's just getting up from the ground and he's like this. Yeah, I, who knows? We, we just don't know. I mean, I. That's something I've. All we know about is that Peter decided he was going to get this. Show on the road. Yeah. And he was going to roll. Oh, man. He almost did, too. Hoo-wee. Yeah. Well, let's pick it up here, Noel. Yes. In verse 52, then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts. You did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. So Jesus shames them. He just calls them out oh. on what they're doing. He wow. goes, I've been with you in the temples every single day. You could have come gotten me any day. And now you show up with clubs and a frickin' army. Really interesting how that is. Interesting that that's how and when you decide to come get me. Am I leading rebellion? No. What he's really saying is, if this is legit... Then why didn't you take me in public? What's the why problem? do we have to do this under the guise of darkness? So if it's so legitimate and I'm so dangerous, then why are you here at night? This this makes absolutely yeah. no sense. And they they don't respond to him because they can't. They have nothing to say. They never do. No, he just continues to out them for the hideous, hideous people, the liars yeah. that they are. And I think the phrase "This is your hour when darkness reigns" is really scary isn't that sad what jesus is basically saying is okay you want it you got it you want darkness you get darkness you want satan you get satan you you want it to go like this i'm taking my hands off have it your way you made your bed you can lie in it you now belong to satan yeah, you're his pawn he just hands them over i mean how scary is to think that God would give you over like that. But I'll tell you, you, you can harden your heart to the point that he goes, since you've already hardened your heart, uh, hands off, you're on yeah. your own. And, and we've seen him do that before in the Bible. He did that with Pharaoh. It says in the book of Exodus that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and then it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that was just basically the same thing. Like, Pharaoh had no no idea that he ever ever wanted to submit to this God and God said fine if that's how you want to play it I'll I'll, I'll one-up you on that one I'll make it even harder 
he can do that because he's a sovereign God. Yeah. And the whole power of darkness phrase is really interesting too. Yeah. Um, I was cross referencing Colossians 113, just a few books to the right in your Bible. And it says this about Jesus. This is the Apostle Paul now writing years later. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness. That word domain, by the way, is the same word that we just read, power. Just translated a little bit different. Same word. For he rescued us from the domain or power of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That very power that he handed the religious leaders over to is the same power that when we come to Christ and we cry out for a savior and for forgiveness, he rescues us from that power. Isn't that incredible? No longer are you fair game for Satan. No longer. You belong to Christ. He redeemed you. That gives me goosebumps. It's so beautiful. Mm. It's so cool. So so now, um, now we're going to go into the really, um, the, it, it's going to get really dark here for a while. Uh, Matthew, Mark's gospel say at this point, um, all the disciples just flee. They scatter. And in verse 54, it says, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. Mm. I think we should stop right there for a minute because yeah. I want to say a few things about the high priest, the priesthood, all yeah. of those things. Because some of you have some sort of religious background where the word priest means something to you. Um, and unless you're Jewish, it probably means something completely yeah. different than what we're talking about here. So, uh, and then others of us have really no Concept idea. Priest, no, yeah. not, not a big one. So, so let me just kind of get us all on the same page here with what this is talking about. So way, 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 way back in the Old Testament, God designated of the 12 tribes of Israel that the tribe of Levi would be the priestly tribe. It was yes. a huge honor for that tribe to be chosen. And so of the priests that had to come out of this line, there was one upstanding, godly, supposedly, man, supposed to be, godly man who would be chosen to be the high priest. And that position was assigned for life. Yeah. God said it was for appointed life. for life. Yes. Yes, exactly. And, and who chose the high priest? Who chose who that was going to be? I don't know. Who? That was that was God. Oh, okay. <laughs> who chose? Yeah, I mean, this is She's like, I don't know. It's if always God. We didn't God. discuss it. Don't ask me. <laughs> I don't know everything. <laughs> it's always God. Whoever the former high priest was would go into like intense prayer prior to you know, their end, you know, if they were getting really old, they would pray about this. And it was intense. Like choosing the high priest was a huge deal. I mean, this was going to be a leader of Israel. I mean, this was a really, really important position. There was prayer and, and God would reveal to them who that high priest was going to be. And so that's how the high priests were chosen. They had to be from the tribe of Levi. These were upstanding leaders. These were incredible men who knew their Bibles. And then... Rome was like, that's a very powerful position. These people really respect the high priest. You know what we're going to do? We'll choose the high priest. They'll be whoever our guy is. They'll, they'll, they'll still be Jews. Don't worry about that. We'll make sure they're Jews. We'll choose him though. And then if we don't like him anymore, we're going to remove him, put a different guy in. So they just completely destroy this entire holy sacred process that God has set up for the people of Israel. And because Rome is a pagan and evil nation, they're putting in guys who are really evil. They may be Jewish, but they're not following God. They don't adhere to the rules. They don't meet the basic qualifications of a priest. This is really problematic. And James points out, and they yep. have to be from the line of Aaron. So the not high just, priest. Too. Yeah, the high priest. Not yeah. just from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Levi, from the line of Aaron. So specific. The Romans don't care. They've got like this guy. He seems to like us. He really does whatever we say and he wants power. So we'll put him in. Uh, he didn't do what we want. We'll take him out. We'll put in another guy. Mm -hmm. And so they're just shuffling guys in and out just for their own best interest. And so the high priest um, is sort of a joke. They, they have no spiritual authority from God and certainly no spiritual leadership. Robin says Caiaphas. 
this is who we're talking about, Robin. Yes, that's where this is leading up to. That's right. <laughs> All right, so, and you also had to kind of like be in bed with Rome to get chosen. Yeah. So the Sadducees we pointed out were just horrible, horrible, horrible people. And um, they were the ones who were the running the whole temple yes. scam. And the high priestly family. So a guy named Annas had been put in as the high priest in 6 AD. So like just six years after, you know, we switched from BC. And then he ruled and reigned in that position and fleeced everybody at the temple by so robbing horrible. them blind uh, until 15 AD. And then Rome, I don't know what happened, but Rome, no, we're done with you. And so they knocked him off his pedestal. But Annas was very powerful. Very so crafty. He's like, that's fine. We'll just try to keep it in the family because we have this really good thing going on with the money. So he had between sons-in-law and sons, five kids. And five boys. They all, yeah, five boys. They all just kind of like got picked by Rome here and there. So at this moment in history where we're at right now with Jesus, Caiaphas, who is Annas' son-in-law, is technically the high priest. In fact, John, in his gospel, sarcastically says, Caiaphas was the high priest that year. And if you don't know the story, the whole sarcasm would go right over your head. It wasn't supposed to be that year. It was supposed to be his entire life. Yeah, but it was so corrupt by this time that he's like, yeah, well, that year, Caiaphas yeah. was it. But we all know situations where you have, like, the figurehead, who's a puppet, and then you have the real force behind that. The one who's actually pulling the strings. Guess who the real force was? That was Annas. Was Annas. Yeah, Annas was making the calls. He was the godfather. And then we've got, you know, Caiaphas is his puppet who was extremely wicked and evil. Yeah. I mean, he held his own in that regard, but he wasn't making all the decisions on his own. He just happened to be serving as high priest, put that in quotes. Yeah. And sometimes I, I think the people really viewed Annas as being the high priest. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was the one pulling all the strings. They knew it. He was, he was probably, he was really in charge, right? And so what I think is so cool, and it just, the historicity of the Bible is incredible. Yeah. Uh, archaeologists believe that they have found the precise house of Annas mm -hmm. and his family. And this house is insane. It's like 6,500 square feet. Mm-hmm. And it's right off this viaduct that's like a direct line into the temple. So they like hop out of bed and get a on the freeway. A viaduct is like a, a bridge that like spans a, bridge. a little valley. <laughs> so they get on the freeway, go over. I mean, these guys were insanely wealthy. They had a bathtub. Can you imagine? They uncovered his bathtub. Well, they think so. They can't. It's like he didn't like scratch his name into stuff. So we don't know for sure. It's in the right location. According to everything it's we have. huge. It's palatial. Yeah, it's, it's the right era. His. We're pretty sure it was his. But I just think that's fascinating. It just shows the level of uh, just contempt for all things spiritual and the corruption of these guys. The way they had so much money was by stealing it from the people in the temples. If you haven't been with us for a, a you quite a while. You need to go back to those, ep those episodes. Where... <laughs> we describe what they did to the people who it's came horrible. to bring sacrifices, which they were required, and how they they extorted money left and right in the most evil ways. I mean, it's horrible. So they were, I don't know how much they would be worth in today's monetary, but multi, multi, multi million. As far as a percentage of the population, they are like not just the 1%, but like the 0.1%. They're the top of the top in terms of wealth. Yeah. And probably also evil. There's another group that's really important here. They're called the Sanhedrin. Right. So that's a term that if you've read the Bible, you're probably at least somewhat familiar with the Sanhedrin. So kind of think of the Sanhedrin as what we would look at as the Supreme Court. It had to have as a quorum a minimum of 23 and a maximum of 71. So you notice odd numbers, so it can't ever be like an even split on a decision. And the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court, would be made up of... Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, things like that. And these would have been people who would have worked their way up, much like our Supreme yeah. Court. You, In the lower courts. You <laughs> show your knowledge of the law, your ability to deliver justice. Um, they had an amazing jurisprudence system. I mean, really, probably the best ever. Unbelievable. And always no so concerned that a person would be wrongly convicted like that was their their whole system was set up 
to make sure that nobody was ever accused and convicted of a crime that they were not guilty they of. They were ridiculously intent on fairness and adherence to the systems and procedures that allowed for that fairness so that there wouldn't be bias towards the person as they're going through the process, that they would be treated well, that everybody would have an opportunity to speak, that there couldn't be collusion between different members no to make bribes, up stories. No. It was, we'll talk yeah. more about the justice we'll process. We'll get to that tomorrow. It's, Don't and miss tomorrow. It's just, gonna be amazing. Just as a thought process, it's really sort of incredible to read about a justice system like that right now with all the stuff going on and being like, oh my goodness. I mean, this is very much how God set this up. Yeah. And they're so concerned with making yeah. sure true justice is served. That's right. Right? Not falsely convicting Amen. and not falsely um, imprisoning or hurting. Or executing. I mean, they were... Ever. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, I'm looking at our time, so here's what I want to do. Let yes. me describe to you the, the setup of Caiaphas's and Annas's house and where we're going to find Peter. Because tomorrow, I thought we'd get to it today, but we're not going to. Sorry. Tomo no, it's fine. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about Peter actually in this little courtyard yeah. where he will deny Jesus three times, but I want you to be able to kind of get a picture. Like, I know I have one in my mind, and I don't know how accurate it is, but let me describe to you what it would have looked like, and then you create the picture in your own mind. So yeah. tomorrow, we actually have a picture of Peter. We can see the scene. It's gonna make a lot more sense that way. So first of all, totally normal in this day for everybody that families would kind of cloister together. Mm -hmm. So um, if, a, if a son went off to get married, he would, he would, before he, you get betrothed, that's like engaged, it was official and legal, but they didn't come together. He would go back to his father's house then, and he would usually add on to his father's house and make, make a little addition, make a place for his new little bride. And then he would go get his bride and bring her, you know, the wedding feast, and then he would bring her back to that place that he had made. So this would happen over generations, and so they would kind of cloister together in little, they're all, almost like little neighborhood, I guess. So now, of course, Annas and Caiaphas and the others who aren't named, but his brothers and half-brothers and whatever, his, um, his brothers-in-law, I guess I should say, they would have had this enormous um, palatial compound. compound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, compound's the word. So in the middle of this compound would be a courtyard. Can you see the courtyard? Courtyard, and it's huge. And beautiful. In the middle, yes. I, I always picture a fountain, and I know there was no fountain in the middle of it, but for some reason, in my mind, there's a fountain in the courtyard. So, so that's what you get from living in Arizona too long. Um, so there's this courtyard, and then shooting off from that courtyard in various directions would be, you know, another palace, and another palace, and another palace, and that is where the families would live. So we have our big courtyard here. I'm just guessing. Maybe Annis's compound places over here and he's got all his stuff and it's beautiful and then this way we have um maybe Caiaphas's compound over here and then you got another brother over here and so it kind of went out I think kind of like spokes that's the only way I can really envision how this would have worked and they all were together then as Noel was saying there was just a little bit of a valley and then you had the temple mount over there and because the great hall where trials were to be held, not that that happened here for a while, uh -huh. um, was over there. They would they built this like bridge it was called a viaduct across that little valley, and then they could just very quickly go back and forth from palace to, you know, wherever they needed court. to be over court or the temple or whatever. Now, remember that these Sadducees. This is a Sadducee family, were hated by the people so in general. Much. And you can understand why, right? For very good reason, yeah. Because they were very knew. hateful people. They knew that these people were robbing them and they were dishonoring God, but there was nothing they could do about it because they had no power and Rome didn't give a rip what they were doing. As long as Rome gets their money and everything is basically peaceful, Rome doesn't care. They have no vested interest in making sure that you're having the good life. So there was no one to ask or tell or snitch or whatever. You just had to suck it up and do it. So they were really hated people. So they kind of watched their backs. So 
there was a long corridor from that courtyard that would go out to the main street out front. And at the street with the corridor, there would have been a gate and that gate would have been carefully guarded. I don't know what the gate was made out of. Was it metal? Was it wood? I don't know, but it would have been substantial because you can't just have the riffraff coming in. They might do something bad to the Sadducees. So they always had that carefully guarded. So what we're going to find out tomorrow is that Peter and John are going to gain entrance to this courtyard. And in fact, it tells us in the book of John that John, somehow, some way, in the providence of God, had connections to the priests and was allowed in with his buddy, like he had a buddy pass with Peter, who had no connections. Uh, For obvious reasons. Yeah, I mean, he was the, like the ear whacking kind of dude. Burned every bridge he got near. Probably. But anyway, they, they knew John somehow. And so John was able to get Peter past the gate through the corridor into that courtyard. Meanwhile, we'll find this out tomorrow, Jesus is being tried in the house of Annas and then across the courtyard over to the house of Caiaphas and then across the courtyard out the viaduct over to the great hall where the trials were supposed to be held in the first place. So Cindy says like a castle gate? Probably. I don't know. Maybe. Sounds something, about right. Something like that. I mean, I'm sure it was quite something, you know. Um, it would have had to withstand anybody trying to break it down or whatever. And, and it tells us tomorrow that there's a girl guarding it. So I don't think it was too compromised yeah. or they wouldn't have put a girl in charge. So yeah, they didn't have a very high view of women. So that is a little surprising. Yeah, there was a girl. But anyway, so kind of kind of get that picture in your mind. See if you can paint. I, I always feel like if I can just kind of like see it, smell it, hear it. I, I want to put myself there so that the story makes more sense it's more memorable and also so it kind of just means more to me so mm -hmm. so build build your uh palatial castle tonight in your mind with the courtyard put a fountain in it if you want to i don't care and, um, and then tomorrow so night sure tomorrow night we'll get into P where peter is and what's going on at that time and how it comes this ear whacking dude decides he's gonna deny jesus deny he even knows him and vehemently so and then we'll talk about what happens to him at the end of that yeah. scenario and it's it's uh it's sad but let me just end by saying this if the bible were just written by a whole bunch of guys uh or just general people or just disciples not under the inspiration of the holy spirit who were just trying to make up a good story None of this would be in here. Yeah. This is not uh, happy for Peter. This does not put him in a good light. It doesn't put any of the disciples in a good light. It puts them yeah. in the worst possible light. And I praise God that he loves us enough that when we fail miserably, he doesn't brush it under the rug. Yeah. In fact, he creates a way for us to be saved. And that's so incredible. Yeah. And so incredible. Yeah, so in the next couple of nights, we're going to be walking with Jesus to the cross and it's going to be really sad mm -hmm. and it's also the most important thing you can ever know about because what Jesus did on the cross was the turning point in all of humanity it separates the old from the new it's brought us life and so if if you've been watching you've been listening and you're just at a point where you go yeah I know I'm a sinner I know I've fallen short of the righteousness that God requires and I want I want the forgiveness Jesus offered we're going to say a really fast prayer and just you can just cry out to Jesus and ask for that because he he wants you to have that he's been searching for you your whole life he's been chasing after you and this mm -hmm. is the moment so I'm gonna just pray a quick prayer if that's you this is just an externalization of something that's already happened in your heart it doesn't save you it doesn't um, change anything except what God's already done in your heart you're just making it more real for yourself so if that's you, just say, Lord Jesus, I am so aware of my sin. I'm so aware of how horribly I've hurt your heart because of my ongoing sin, how, how evil I have been in this world. And Lord, there's nothing I can do to be perfect, to be righteous, or to even earn righteousness. And so, Lord, I'm just um, I'm asking that you would give it to me because of what you did on the cross for me. And I'm so grateful, Lord. I know that you have forgiven me completely and wholly because of my repentance. And Jesus, I just love you so much. And I just ask that you would use me 
and that you would guide my life and guide the, the plans you have for me, Lord, because I want to serve you because I'm so grateful that you have given me repent, that you've given me righteousness. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. And I just want to close by just saying a prayer right now for our country and everything that is going on. I just feel like that is something that we need to do together. So yeah. join me in your heart as we just cry out to you, Lord Jesus. First of all, thank you that you are sovereign, Lord. And when yeah. everything is just looking absolutely bleak and hopeless and out of control, and there's so much evil happening on so many different levels, Jesus, how we rest in the fact and we know that even in that, it, nothing took you by surprise, nothing is out of your control, and that somehow, some way, we believe that you will use this in our lives and in our country to bring about healing and, and spiritual blessing. And Lord, I pray that that would happen. I pray, Lord, that all of us, but especially those who don't know you, would, would turn their hearts to you, that they would see the emptiness mm -hmm. of, of trying to somehow achieve things that in our sinfulness we can never achieve, but that you are there with forgiveness and hope and peace and reconciliation and self-discipline and, and love and togetherness. And Jesus, I pray for all those things Lord, we ask that you would heal our land and that you would heal our country. And Lord, I hate this division that's going on. I hate it. I hate it happening in our country. I hate it happening in our churches. Lord, would you please, please supernaturally touch us with your healing, loving hand and bring us back together again. Oh, we love you so much and we're so glad that we can rest on your promises and we can lean on you and know that you do care for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. We love you guys. Thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow night. Go out, be light, make good decisions, go love people, and we love you. Have a good night, team.